Well, do you remember 1975? <laughs> do you remember Jaws? Oh, yes. oh, yeah. Do you remember that great line? Roy Schneider's on the back of the boat, and he's chumming, right? And he's making, he's just yakking at the captain, because he he's not happy being back there doing that. And the giant shark appears right at the back of the boat. He doesn't even see him for a minute. But then when he sees him, what does he say? We're going to need a bigger boat. <laughs> Great line. Great line that has really permeated society in some ways, hasn't it? I mean, we've all heard that line at one time or another. And sometimes it can feel like that when we're creating our dreams, when suddenly we need a course correction. We need something new or we need to try something different. Maybe even come up with a brand new dream. Maybe the one that we are working on is not working out. Not working out. Sometimes it feels like we get that wonderful, universal two by four. <laughs> Sometimes it feels that way. I think we've all felt that way when we are in the, um, in the um, experience and we go, oh, what is this? What is this? What is happening right now? Why am I having this experience? But sometimes that is the only way that we can hear that still small voice within us. Sometimes we need that jolt and experience to elevate us and move us to the next level of awareness, don't we? We just aren't hearing it in any other way. The advanced course advanced course. So we're continuing with our series, Building Our Field of Dreams, with my talk today, we're going to need a bigger boat. We're going to need a bigger boat. And we've talked about clearing the field. We talked about that. Reverend Glenn delivered that to you on the first week that uh, we started our series. We then talked last week about planting our dream. And now it's the growing season. Now it's the growing season. And like the Jaws movie, sometimes things don't grow the way that we think they're going to. They don't take the path that we think they're going to take. We find a few detours along the way. And we talked last week about the importance of our intuition. Remember a story of Samson and Delilah and how we questioned whether he was listening to his intuition when she was probing to uh, find out the source of his strength? Well, Mary um, Manon Morrissey, who wrote the book that we're using this week, she calls this the voice for God. And I like that shift, the voice for God. And this comes from A Course in Miracles, which actually says the voice for God is as loud as your willingness to listen. The voice for God is as loud as you're willing to listen. Now, most of us have voices that we hear in our heads, don't we? I'm not talking schizophrenia. Just talking about that voice of fear, that voice of criticism, that voice of ego. So we have all those different voices talking to us. So it's important for us to listen for the voice for God and to differentiate and to know the difference between those. And it's a slight shift in perspective from what we usually hear, which is the voice of God, isn't it? That's the, usually the phraseology that we hear, the voice of God. But the voice for God. What is the voice for God within you? From personal experience, I know that as I have cultivated my own deeper listening of that voice for God, that I've learned to recognize that voice instead of my ego, instead of my critic, Instead of the condemnation sometimes. The voice that tells me I might be less than. Anybody else have those voices sometimes running around in your... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So knowing the difference in the voice for God is, is important for us. And understanding our intuition, which Mary then says we turn into inspired insight. Inspired insight. Because that voice within us knows best, even though we may not be able to fathom what that message is all about. Have you ever gotten one of those? The one that I got several years ago that wouldn't let me go about, um, no, I'm not going to say starting the spiritual center. We already did that part. The one about selling my house. It's like, no, I don't want to sell my house. It's not a good time to sell the house. I like, sell the house. 
Why am I selling the house? Sell the house. I don't need to sell the house. Sell the house. I don't want to sell the house. Sell the house. All right, I'll sell the house. I still am not exactly sure why, but we'll see. We'll see. But when we listen, we learn to think of spirit as our partner in co-creation. How about that for a nice relationship? Our partner in co-creation. And the beauty of listening is that we recognize those nudges that we get towards outer motion. Take action. What about? Try this. Go there. We begin to listen to that. We begin to trust it. And we know what that feels like, don't we? We've all had it. And we usually have it when we go back to it and go, I knew I should have done that. Right? But imagine being on the front side of that and having the level of trust in that to take those directions, to heed that guidance when it comes through and to change course, to take the step, to make the effort. I've heard it called friend. I've heard it called presence. That's always with us. And it's always with us even in the dark and scary times. We're always guided by something greater than ourselves if we allow it. If we allow it. And that can be the tough part, can't it? Because we always want to be in there stirring things up. Do it my way. I call it my two-year-old. I'll do it my way. I'll do it my way. Especially when that guidance we don't understand. But what I've come to realize, and I would bet you have too as you look back on your life, that even though you might not understand it, we eventually come to see how that was an important key step on our path of unfoldment. Mary tells a story in her book, great stories in this book. She tells a story about how she was guided to bungee jump. Now that's crazier than sell your house. But she kept arguing. She kept saying to the voice, just be quiet. Be quiet. I don't need to bungee jump. I don't need to bungee jump. And it wouldn't stop. She says one day in the shower, she finally said, okay, enough already, I'll bungee jump. So she did her investigation and she went. She bungee jumped. And as she rises up on the platform with all of the straps and things on her to jump off of this, she said it felt like she was on just a piece of cardboard up there with a 19-year-old going, cowabunga, dude. And she's like, oh, Lord. And at that moment, she looks up and she says, oh, God, what are you doing to me, right? Where are you guiding me? And in the distance, she saw a church with a big cross on top of it. And she said, I turn it over to spirit. And she jumped. She jumped. And in that moment, as she was flying out into space, she said she realized that she was actually jumping into the greater experience of herself in that moment, of her ministry, of her church, and of her marriage. Because she and her husband were at a point where they were realizing that their marriage needed to end, but she was struggling with that decision. And that she realized as she jumped off of that, that everything in her life needed to transform, just like she had just transformed in that leap of faith, literally, off of that platform. So we may not understand the guidance at the time, but if we keep following the guidance, we will be led. We will be led. She says that as, in, as we increasingly listen to and follow our inner guidance, we gradually develop a deeper relationship with God. Increasingly listen to and follow. That's the key, isn't it? Because we can listen, but if we don't take action on it, we're not building that trust, are we? Because when we take action and it, it works out like we believe it should, like we've been guided that it should, then we begin to build our trust, don't we? We begin to build our faith. But if we don't take that action, we don't. So taking the action is how we build that deeper relationship with spirit. And we know from the story of the prodigal son that when we turn to spirit, spirit turns to us, doesn't it? Spirit turns to us. So building that relationship with spirit, how do we do that? How do we do that? Well, it's like we build any relationship, isn't it? When I, was, when I first moved here back in the early 90s, I was at a holiday party with our company, and many of the consultants and so forth that we were dealing with were there, and I met a woman 
And we exchanged business cards. You know, you did a little networking thing. And, oh, let's get together. Went home, tossed the card, right? Well, I got a phone call from her the next day. She said, let's get together for lunch. I really enjoyed our conversation. I said, wow, nobody ever calls, right? Nobody ever calls. And she did. We got together. We became very close friends for very many, many, many years. But what she shared with me, and I shared with her, I said, you know, people say that all the time at networking events. Oh, yeah, let's get together. And I said, it usually doesn't happen. And she said, well, if you're going to, it's like Holmes, if you're going to be want a friend, be a friend. And she said, you've got to nurture relationships. You've got to nurture friendships. You've got to be active and involved and reach out to each other, spend time with each other. And it was a very good lesson for me about that. And the same is true in developing our relationship with spirit. To learn that voice for God that we have within us. We must spend time in the stillness, listening, getting to know the resonance. If your friend calls you on the phone, they don't have to say, hi, this is Susan. I know her voice, right? Hi, this is Penny. I know her voice. Hi, this is Ron. I know his voice. Right? We don't have to identify ourselves when we have a friend that we know their voice. And the same is true with spirit. When we know the voice for spirit within us, we don't have to question is that my ego talking or is this really what I should do? We'd never question that. But sometimes we're afraid to take that inspired action, aren't we? Like Mary and her bungee jumping. She procrastinated for a while before she got up on that platform and jumped. And we can be afraid. And that's normal. That's normal. Have you ever had a nightmare? You ever had a nightmare so bad that you just couldn't hardly wake up from the dream? You had to kind of quickly reach over and turn on the light and then get back under the covers? Yeah, because we have to illuminate the room and get rid of the, the scary dark places and the shadows. If you imagine if you're standing out in the desert, in our desert with no moon, it's pretty dark out there, right? There's not a lot of lights. But you've got a lantern. And as you hold that lantern you notice there's a circle of light around you. And everything inside the circle is illuminated, and you can see pretty, pretty easily that there's no scary things there. But at the edge of the light, you can't see. You can't see. And we can become frozen in fear at that juncture. But what if we take a step? The light moves, doesn't it? and we can see a little further on the path, we might be able to see that there's actually a ravine right there. We don't want to go any further. So we can change directions and go a different way. But we know that this light is always there, so we need to, to go to the edge of the light that we can see and trust that the next step will be revealed to us as the light moves with us, that we will see what's next on our path, that it will be illuminated. It's said that the next step is always illuminated for us as we step forward in faith. So spirit can only do for us what spirit can do through us. Have you ever heard that? Sure, that's one of Ernest Holmes' big quotes, isn't it? Spirit can only do for us what spirit can do through us. But boy, that can be hard to do, can't it? Allowing spirit to work through us. Because we want to be in there stirring the pot. I have a friend that comes over sometimes and I'll be cooking something and she cannot keep her hands out of the pot. The lid comes off and she starts, it's like, I don't need to stir. It's already been stirred. Stop stirring. <laughs> this is also the same one that mashed potatoes and picked the beaters up and splattered the kitchen. So anyway, uh -huh. out of the kitchen. <laughs> Stop stirring. No, no making potatoes. But, um, you know, what, that's what we want to do. We want to meddle, don't we? I can guide my life. I know what's best for my life. But we don't leave room for spirit when we do that. We don't leave room to allow spirit to work through us. I've had a few situations like that recently where I'm starting to pull back a little bit to let go of my immediate need to fix something. I had a little thing happen this week that I immediately get on my cell phone. I'm going to text, you know, this is what we need to do. 
And for some reason, I paused and said, well, I'll let that stew a little bit. I'll let that sit a little bit. And I knew what I wanted the outcome to be, but I also knew that what I wrote in my text was probably not going to get me there. So I backed away from that. This was like 9 o'clock in the morning. I let it stew for the day, and then it began to unfold in ways that I could not have imagined that were natural, easy, gracefully, kind, and it all came through just fine. But I allowed spirit to work through me with all the parties that I couldn't touch. My text would have touched one person and probably upset them, quite frankly. But the way it worked out is that there were multiple people then involved and it worked out completely perfectly. But we've got to allow spirit room to do the work. You remember a couple of months ago, we were doing Napoleon Hill's book, Think and Grow Rich, and we were doing that work, and he created what he called mastermind groups. Remember those? We had one here going on for about a month. We played around with, had some fun. Well, Mary has a version of that that she calls Partners in Believing. Isn't that a fun name? Partners in Believing. And it's similar to a mastermind group, but it's smaller. You connect with two or three people, so there's only three or four of us that would get together. And we, um, these are objective third parties. This is not your spouse and your best friend. These are objective third parties who can be with you and hold the space for your dream. Sometimes the people closest to us might have a vested interest in the outcome of the dream. Success or failure, right? And sometimes they can't always be as objective as a third party, say someone in your spiritual community. I think these partners in believing might be wonderful small groups for us to create here as we're seeking to manifest not only our individual dreams, but also our collective dream and community. I think this could be a wonderful outlet for us as we go through our own, implementing our own co-creation process. So that would be um, just forming small groups, people of like mind, which most of us are here. And I think the great question that, it, that is asked in this group, one of them is, if you didn't believe it was impossible, what would you do next? If you didn't believe it was impossible, what would you do next? And I think that's a great question because it causes us to step out of the thinking mind of, oh, well, the limitation, into that co-creative, infinite possibility place of, well, what would I do if I didn't think it was impossible? What would I do? What would you do if you didn't think that which you're seeking to manifest was impossible? So the general process of the partners in believing is make progress reports each week. You report in. You allow time to share. And with only three to four people, you'll have time within an hour, say, to share, hour, hour and a half, and brainstorm. Use the collective consciousness and brainstorm with the others. Ask those suppose questions. Suppose it's not impossible. Suppose money's no object. Suppose you cannot fail. Suppose the universe is already lined up everything you need if you just take that first step. Opens up infinite possibilities, doesn't it? And then commit to act activities to accomplish each week. So you have, you're being held accountable for what you're achieving each week with your group. Encourage creative thinking. Celebrate the small wins. You may not have manifested the whole vision, but celebrate the little things. Celebrate the little steps along the way. And then finally, challenge limited thinking. And that's why I think it would be good in a community like ours, because we can, it's easy to recognize limited thinking in others. It's really hard to recognize it in ourselves. Really hard to recognize it in ourselves. And of course, we would add prayer support to that. We would add prayer support to that as the fuel that would then support those dreams and visions to coming into fruition. Sound like a good idea? Mm -hmm. All right. Maybe we'll start a sign-up sheet. Sorry, Tony, I didn't make one. <laughs> yeah, one more sign-up sheet. So do you remember a film star, early, early star, named Mary Pickford? 
Anybody heard Mary Pickford? She was known as the girl with the curls and was an early pioneer for women in Hollywood. She was involved in getting the Oscars started and that sort of thing. And she reminds us that the thing we call failure, failure is not falling down, it's staying down. Would you agree? Yeah, we all fall down. But if we stay down, that's the true failure, isn't it? Not getting back up. And dream building and achieving our goals can be challenging work, can it? How many set goals or intentions first of the year with us? Yeah, a lot of us did, right? It's August. How are we doing? I got some big nods. I got some uh -huh's, I got some uh -huh. <laughs> What was that intention again? What was it? What was it I said? Yeah. Exactly. Well, as religious scientists, I think we can be, um, well, we sometimes think that we're not going to experience setbacks, disappointments, even tragedies. But we do. And it's not because of something we've thought. It's not because of something we've done. It's not because there's a vengeful God out to get us because we said a bad word. I don't know why. But I don't believe it's any of those things. Because I believe in a loving God that is only out for our best interest. And I don't know why things happen. Challenging things, difficult things, disappointment, sadness, grief. I don't know. But what I do know is that if we have a relationship with spirit, that the faith that we have by listening to that voice, by knowing that voice, by having that relationship, that that will carry us through. That will carry us through to the other side. We've all had dark nights of the soul where our faith goes crashing against the rocks into a million pieces and we might even shake our fist at God and say, Why? Why? We get stuck in the why. We get stuck in the why. Why would God allow this to happen? It's a classic question, isn't it? And again, I don't know why. Sometimes life happens. We also don't know what the other person's path is if there's another party involved in that, do we? We only know our experience of it. We know it hurts stinks, it's unfair, maybe it's even wrong. Maybe it's even wrong. But we can pick up the pieces of our faith by remembering, God is, I am, the truth is, thank you God, and let it go. Let it go. And as we continue to deepen into that, that's our five steps of affirmative prayer, five steps of treatment. Mary calls it five steps of building our faith. But as we can be with that, move through our anger, move through our grief, move through our sadness, and stay with that and build our faith and recognize that we are source of a divine presence, we are source of a divine essence, we are that which it is. God is, I am. The truth is, what is that higher truth? What is that higher realization of love, of truth, of harmony? When we can remember that, building our faith back through prayer, we begin to see that glimmer. We begin to see the glimmer of hope and knowing that we're going to be okay. And hope is that first rung of climbing back, isn't it? And we continue to move up that ladder. We also need that faith when our dream is faltering. When our dream is looking like it's falling apart, nothing's supporting it, it's not coming our way, we can't make it happen, we want to we quit. The question of quitting becomes very, very um, forefront in our minds. Mary reminds us, she says, if what you desire cannot come into being for whatever reason, then something bigger is trying to happen in your life. 
regardless of how the circumstances may appear. That can be hard to accept. What do you mean I can't have this? This is what I've always wanted. This is what I've been working on and creating forever. What do you mean I can't have it? I am a religious scientist after all. Do we give up? Do we quit when everything's pointing to let go of our dream? She suggests that we take inventory before we call defeat and throw in the towel. We take a little inventory. The first thing is to check in with the voice for God. Is it time to give up? Or is it time to simply refuel? Is it time to refuel? We certainly don't want to stop short of our miracle. Next, we ask for that inner guidance. If this dream is for my highest good, increase my passion for it and show me the way. Increase my passion for it and show me the way. If this dream will not benefit myself and others, redirect me. This or something better. Now, if you all know me, you know that I don't like that phrasing. Because I always ask, who decides? We don't believe in a God outside of ourselves. We believe in spirit within. Who decides this or something better? Well, I've had a perspective shift. Aren't you glad? Mary says, she reframes it. She suggests that since we co-create with the divine, that we can only look at creation from our limited perspective, right? Exactly. While spirit is infinite possibilities, spirit plays a bigger game. It plays at a higher level than we do. Thank goodness. So it's like having an executive board. This or something better. Here's my idea. Here's what I want to have the experience of. Or something even better. Along these same sort of lines. Right? Along these same sort of lines. But it opens us up to allowing spirit to work through us. Because it opens us up to a broader realm. If we limit ourselves to a phone booth, that's our perspective, isn't it? Spirit's up on the mountain, like Mary was up on the bungee jump platform. She could see the bigger vista of her life at that point. We, too, can open up to allowing spirit the bigger vista through our life of our limited possibilities. <coughs> Excuse me. So letting go and letting God, this or something better. But it has to be from the standpoint of... I am still knowing what it is that I'm seeking and I'm allowing spirit to work through me for this little limited thing that I know I want or something even greater and more expansive than that. I want a career that's this, but I really want to feel this way and spirit goes, well, that one's not going to do it, but this one will. This one will. And we allow that space for spirit to move and work through our lives. So I've shifted my perspective on that a little bit. So if you are still at a crossroads in your dream building at this time, there's another question to ask is whether this is a failure or is it just feedback? Is it failure or is this just feedback? And I always think of our friend Edison. A thousand experiments to try and figure out the light bulb. 999 were feedback. 999 were feedback that got him to the 1,000th one that illuminated the light bulb. <clears throat> so when we can receive feedback and not hear what? Criticism. Yeah. Know the difference? Yeah. It's hard sometimes though, isn't it? Feedback feels like criticism, feels like I'm wrong, feels like I made a mistake, feels like I failed. But it's perspective, isn't it? It's perspective. We hear, what we hear is criticism and failure and we get defensive. And we close down to spirit's activity then, don't we? Because we've got our defenses up. Spirit cannot operate through us at that point if we are defensive. So again, remaining in that expansiveness. We get in the way rather than becoming the way. We get in the way. So our last step at the crossroads of quitting is to revisit the five questions that Reverend Glenn talked about in the first week. Y'all committed those to memory, right? All right, a little refresher. 
Does this enliven me? Does this dream enliven me? Does it align with my core values? We did a lot of values work last year. Does, do I need help from a higher source? Will it require me to grow into more of my true self? Does it ultimately bless others? And I loved myself revisiting those because those are the questions that I asked myself about this center when the vision came through me. And I was able to answer yes to each and every one of them. And I still can today, which I love that part too because the dream is still unfolding through all of us, isn't it? So I love that. So you will know in your heart this or something better. What is that? What is that? Perhaps through the activities of creating your dream in these past eight months, you've been begun to see that maybe you were thinking too small in January. Or maybe it's time for a little course correction as we move into the last part of the year. And that's okay, isn't it? Because we're creative beings and we can create again. We have a board, we have an executive board through which we co-create. And just like pilots flying airplanes, they're always course correcting, aren't they? They start at point A, they want to get to point B, but they're off course a lot in between because of the winds and the weather and all the other things that happen. But they usually get us to the right place at uh, close to the right time. But it's a course correction. It's being flexible. It's allowing spirit, the vista, the, the expanse to work through us in our lives. So the final point in our, in our message today is, have you ever been in the presence of someone that was really bitter about a lost dream? I, when I was in the jewelry business back in the 80s, when I was a baby, um, <laughs> I had a gentleman that came to work for us who had uh, lost his business uh, in a jewelry store. He had lost his business, had to close his doors, and he came to work for us. But he was so bitter that all he could do was project his negativity, his criticism, his disappointment, all of that, all of his anger at himself. He was projecting that on everybody and everything we were doing in our business. And it got to the point where he was asked to leave because of that. But he was just so bitter about losing that business, that he wasn't able to move through the forgiveness work that we talked about a few weeks ago. And in this case, forgiveness can be forgiving ourselves, can't it? Because he was beating himself up so badly for having failed in his business that he couldn't move on from that. He couldn't take the lessons that he had learned from that and use those in moving forward in his life. So choose better over bitter. Choose better over bitter. Recognize that apparent failures are simply ways of learning. Remember Edison. It's feedback, not failure. So let's recap with our practicing the principles. Again, I have seven for you this week, so we'll move right through these. Recognize the nudges toward our highest good. Know your voice for God. It's persistently nudging you in the direction of your highest good. And very frequently that path may confound us. We may not understand. But when you develop the trust and the voice, you gain trust in taking the steps. Build a relationship with the still small voice for God within you. We do that through prayer and meditation, don't we? Our spiritual practices every single day day every single day and just like nurturing a human relationship we have to spend time with spirit and then watch how spirit shows up in your life this week as coincidences remember our book God winks the God winks in our life the things that we go wow how'd that happen out of the blue right God winks allow spirit to work through your life Number three, go to the edge of the light that you see. Go to the edge of the light that you see and allow the light to expand with you. If you have not built the relationship with spirit, this can be a very scary place. Build the relationship with spirit and then trust the next step will be illuminated for you on your path. 
Number four, create a partners in believing group. I really like that idea. Since I'm in charge of small groups this year, I think I'm going to do it. So stay tuned. Find your partners in believing. Meet once a week. Build the blueprint of your dreams. Fun? Mm -hmm. Yeah, fun. Works for relationships, career, financial, good, better, health, and fitness. Anybody ever had a workout buddy? Yeah, you go to the gym when you got a workout buddy. You're accountable, right? Same thing works here. Find your support team and the people you can support. Goes both ways. And supercharge the realization of your dream. Number five, renew your faith. The five steps of our affirmative prayer. God is. I am. The truth is. Thank you, God. Let it go. So five steps. That's a fun, easy, fast affirmation that we can do at any time to remind ourselves to come back into our center, back into our wholeness. God is, I am, the truth of the situation is. We remember. We remember. Number six, take inventory before declaring defeat. The only power that defeat has in our life is our response to it. The only power that defeat has in our life is our response to it. Bitter or better. Ask for support from your executive team, your executive board, when you are faced at a crossroads, feeling defeated. Do I just need to be refueled? Is this feedback? Ask for a sign. I think I shared with you last week, or shared it somewhere, that I was trying to decide to go back to Virginia a few years ago, whether or not I should go, and I was back and forth and back and forth. I was like, all right, enough. Give me a sign. And I looked up, and the car in front of me had a Virginia license plate. Like, okay. But was that really it? <laughs> Number seven, better, not bitter, the choice of how we respond. Bitter is the fuel for an unhappy life. Check your perspective. Check your perspective about the disappointments, the losses, the, the sadness in your life. Check your perspective. Reframe the story from failure to feedback. Growing our dreams takes focus, planning, and support, doesn't it? Doesn't just happen. Doesn't just happen. Sometimes we too need to get a bigger boat. So I want to close this today with a quote from Ernest Holmes in The Science of Mind. He's the author of The Science of Mind. He's also the founder of Centers for Spiritual Living. And he says that know that the greater the abundance of every good thing which you are bringing out in your life, the more perfectly you are satisfying the divine urge within you. And that divine urge is spirit, right? That spirit, that's the desire coming through you. And he says anything that you can dream of is not too great for you to undertake. If it hurts no one and brings happiness and good into our lives. Anything. And the idea here is that all ideas are sourced of spirit. So how could it possibly be impossible? So peace and blessings to you. Thank you for being with us today. If you were with us for the very first time, I hope that you have enjoyed our service today and that you will stay and connect with us afterwards. We have um, a special team of volunteers to connect with you when you leave here and another token of appreciation for the time that you spent to come and spend Sunday morning with us today. So I would invite you now to join me in an affirmative prayer if you would. So how good it is that we come together on Sundays in celebration of this thing we call life that has its way in through and as each one of us. For we are all manifestations of life itself. We are experiencing life right now, right here in this moment as that harmony and love and joy and peace that is spirit. That infinite and divine source of all that is, was, and ever shall be. And I know that all of that is here now in this room, in through and as each one of us, surrounding us at each and every moment. And knowing that wholeness that we are, that life that we are, that expression of the divine that we are, I know that each of us now steps into that realization of this thing called life through us, of our whole perfection that we are. 
whole, perfect, and complete, right here, right now, as the spiritual manifestation of the divine. And I know as we are in this growing season of our dreams, that we open to feedback, that we allow the creative process to work through us, that we allow spirit to have its way through us, through our lives, through the expression of who and what we are, through the unfoldment of our dreams. We get out of the phone booth, we get up on the platform, and we see the greater vista of what truly is possible for the revelation of the magnificence that we are when we let go and let God. For we know in spirit all things are possible. So if there is anything on your heart this day that you are seeking prayer around, we lift it into this light in this moment, knowing that it is healed, that it is re- revealed, that truth is brought forth, that financial abundance flows, that abundance and prosperity of life and joy flow, that peace is who and what we are. Whatever the need, I know that it is filled in this moment. So it is with a grateful heart that I simply release this into the activity of that one mind of which we are all a part, knowing that it is done. It is already manifest in, in that realm, and we just simply await its manifestation in this one. And we affirm this together by saying, and so it is.